Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Joanna Ritchie. Hi, Joe. Hi, Jeff. How are you liking the studio today? Always great to be in the studio. That's good. I, I got the Michelangelo vibe behind me today. Absolutely. That's okay. I'm, I'm rocking the scrubs today, so it's that kind of day. Right on. We have two phenomenal guests today from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And to kind of set the stage for this discussion, you know, not too many good things came out of COVID-19, but one thing was awesome, the Foot and Ankle Surgery Academy. And their founders, Dr. Matt Cobb and Dr. Hewan Chu. Welcome to Dean's Chat. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate you guys having us. Uh, it's great to see you. And, uh, you know, on Dean's Chat, we're pretty informal. So if it's okay with you, let's go with first names. Hey, Juan, Matt, Joe, and Jeff. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good with that. Fantastic. So, well, thank you so much both again for coming and talking to our audience a little bit about your own individual experiences with podiatry, but also what we're really excited to kind of share is some of the development and uh, inception of the Foot and Ankle Surgery Academy and what the resources are that are out there for students, residents, and faculty alike. So, We'll do a very brief introduction. Dr. Cobb um, specializes primarily in reconstructive surgery, but also a heavy emphasis on pediatrics, which is really unique. Um, did your undergrad at Covenant University, had a division scholarship, if I remember correctly, uh, went on to do his podiatric medical school at California College of Podiatric Medicine and graduated in 2005 and completed his three-year surgical residency program with the Kaiser San Francisco Bay Area Foot and Ankle Residency, um, currently working in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Dr. Haywan Chu specializes in diabetic limb salvage, went uh, to the U University of Santa Cruz, or sorry, University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, graduated with his bachelor's degree in 2007, really? went to, yeah, the banana slugs, right? Fighting banana slugs. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, that's why I was smiling. <laughs> yeah, got to give a shout out, man. Uh, awesome. Then went to uh, Temple University for your podiatric uh, medical school and graduated in 2013, did your residency surgical training program with the VA Palo Alto, uh, as all, along with Stanford University, um, and who were also previously a clinical assistant faculty at University of New Mexico in the orthopedics and rehabilitation department. Welcome to the Dean Chat. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, so what we really want to kind of jump into, if we can kind of start with, is uh, kind of what, how did you guys come up with the Foot and Ankle Surgical Academy? And uh, since some of the audience may not be familiar, what is it? Yeah. Oh man, go for it. Sure. Yeah. So foot and ankle surgery Academy, uh, for short, we call it FASA. It's a compilation of all the surgeries that we could film within our group with our own voiceovers of the primary surgeon thoughts. And then we have, um, some, some questions chimed in by each of us on why you did certain things. It's a very casual kind of off the cuff type, um, video compilation um and i guess the reason we started it was that during the COVID pandemic when all of the surgery centers all the electives were canceled uh surgery centers were shut down to um all those cases residents could not scrub cases around the nation probably around the world um and we didn't know when was there an end to this you know madness and figured well, you know, what, once eventually, like how, how long did it take for electives to come back on several months? Um, when it did come back on the surgery center still did not allow residents to scrub because PPE was short on supply. So they, they only, you know, used it for PPE for the, the, the vital people. Um, so I felt bad that, this whole generation of residents would be lacking exposure to a ton of elective cases or trauma cases. Um, so I, and at the time this was tw early 2020, I started my private practice in late 2019. My clinic wasn't super busy. I was already scrubbing Haas and Cobb's cases just to uh, help them out a little bit and generate some more views from, from my own practice in a way. And you know, they, they have a good reputation in the community. Um, I, I've learned quite a few things through the residents who learn stuff from them. Because before I joined the practice, I was a, a, attending at the VA in New Mexico. And at that time, I didn't know these guys. 
But all I heard was the residents saying, well, Hassan Cobb does it this way. Hassan Cobb does it that way. So, and then they show up me. I'm like, oh, that's a good trick. Like, I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I, it makes sense. I like this technique. And, and so, somehow, like, luckily, I was able to join these guys. And, and, and so I was like, you know, scrubbing cases and learning stuff from them that I um, didn't, haven't seen before in my own training. And I thought, this is good stuff. You know, they do great work. I feel like this is something that the world could see, you know, to help other people. I got a lot of pearls just from scrubbing and I'm sure a lot of other people would too. So that's when, you know, the whole COVID thing came and I figured, well, this is something that I could possibly do. And the kind of the launch point was when I was chatting with um, Hassan Cobb about like, I think I don't know exactly how the conversation came about, but you guys had this idea originally before um, I brought it up, right? What, what yeah. Was so my yeah, my perspective is a little different. Um, so Zach Haas is, was my co-resident in San Francisco, and I came out here two years after practicing in uh, Kaiser at Walnut Creek, and uh, we had futz around with an idea of of, of filming videos. And for us, it was a way to give back. We were trying to figure out, like, how could we give back um, a training that we felt blessed that we had? Like, there's not a lot of places in the country, um, and, you know, it's, and it's not a bragging rights to the, to the program at all. But the, the volume and spectrum of attendings um, that I had and Joe had, she was at the same program. Um, uh, I, just, I just felt pretty honored to be there. And I, I didn't know how to... Uh, give that back. I, di- I didn't think that being individually training with the residents here in VA was enough. Um, and so we, Zach and I had tried a couple of avenues. We tried going down um, investment opportunities for pe- for uh, groups to buy in, and then we would film surgeons live, and then we would comment on it. That didn't work. Um, the, the money needed was astronomical. Um, we tried a, a couple different options. It eventually failed. Um, COVID came and then, and then Chu happened to be here. Um, cause I have no editing skills, no video skills. I, I can barely work a computer. Um, and it was, it was the perfect storm. We started videoing, we just actually started videoing hundreds of surgeries. Uh, and, and, and I, I remember thinking a, a, a couple options. If, if I could just show, what a bunion lateral release is, uh, you know, if I could, if I could visually show that, cause it's actually s- difficult as a resident, it seems like a fascinoma. Um, or if I could show how do you dissect a capsule, I think I'd be happy. Right. And it went from there. We, we started then, all right, do you guys want to throw in, I can't remember what our initial buy-in was. It was two to $5,000. And, and we said, is, One grand each, yeah. yeah, is a, is a thousand bucks worth a camera and the risk to put our stuff out there uh, and and try to demonstrate what it is to to operate in just a a simple educational fashion that's that's uh, well done um, and that that's really how it started it was it was super simple and we had a pile of videos and we started editing at five and six a.m. in the morning we would come in there's nothing else to do like I normally had a clinic of forty to fifty patients and I was seeing six to eight most of them were broken toes when everyone had COVID we were masked and we would just we would edit videos in the morning and it was we had that ability to amass this massive volume, which is kind of how this, this started, which is a little odd actually. Well, it's almost like a beautiful pivot on an opportunity where that could, that time could have gone to anything else. Right. But you guys invested the time and the expertise, and now you have a product that you can share with the world. And I think that that um, having searched the interwebs for, good videos to help students wrap their heads around three-dimensional things, anatomic perspectives, surgical procedures, all at one time. There really isn't great material out there. And what's No, hard, you're right. Yeah, and what's really hard for right. students is they, they don't know what they're looking for. So you can spend hours of time digging through YouTube, watching videos, getting 20 minutes in, and you don't, they don't necessarily know, is this a good video on how to do a lapidus bunionectomy, or is it maybe not such a great video? They don't have that expertise. And so 
having faculty try to dig through what is out there still takes tons of time. So what I appreciate so much about the work that you guys have invested is it's not just like a technique video, right? Like here's how to do it step by step by step. You put so much effort into the editing of here's a case and you walk through it exactly like if I was a student in your clinic on externship. And you go through, here's the clinical things that we were looking at. This is why the patient presented. Here are the x-rays. And I really find that useful from a student perspective, a novice perspective. But then even at a faculty level, the tips, like uh, Haywan was saying, like little tips and pearls, it's like, oh, that's such a great thing to highlight. And the way that you're able to capture it, I think is really exceptional. And I, I should say, I'm not paid to make any promotional stuff here. I'm not trying to sell your product, but just being appreciative of the time, energy, and attention that you guys have put into it, I think is really valuable. I think that was, that was the hardest part initially was I, nobody wants to watch a video that's nauseating and, you know, how do you, how do you get a surgeon's perspective? And so the shock, the shocking part that, you know, when we eventually then decide, well, maybe we have Chu video us and then someone else videos Chu is then you've got a surgeon videoing a surgeon. That's pretty rare. And so then you, they know what they're looking for. There's no discourse. There's no discussion. Like you don't have to talk about what to film. Yeah. Um, and then they even know, Hey, can you move out of the way? <laughs> you know, can we show this tendon transfer? Like they know um, those specifics. That's what's so different. And we all said together, like if we can teach one person, one technique, we'll be happy. Um, and, and that has long since passed by the feedback, which has been a lot of fun for us. Um, and so, yeah, now, now it's just a, a fun entity for us to do. And so you said you guys work with residents. Can you talk a little bit about the residency program that you work with? Well, Dr. Chu was at the program, so I'll let him chat about it. Well, uh, the VA program here, yeah, I was in attending for a year and a half, um, so different now there back when i was there it was just me and one podiatrist now they've bloomed up to five podiatrists and their clinic is different the director and chief is different um and I'll, i think all for the better there's a lot more people there a lot more energy um to invest into training the residents and there's only one program in new mexico so the residents have a free-for-all all you can eat buffet of surgery i think they're graduating with like close to a thousand cases by the time they're done with residency, um, which is pretty good for any, any program standard. Um, so that, I mean, like everything, every, every case that every podiatrist does in Albuquerque or even the whole state, they have access to, uh, so sometimes they're driving up to Santa Fe or to different, uh, remote areas for particularly rare cases. I've heard that they're doing too. So it's, it's really good for them. Do they have to reach out to you specifically or is it part of their like rotation schedule to come out to your office? We have, uh, so at our clinic, we do grand rounds once a month. Um, and then they, they have an, uh, uh, they call it, um, what do they call it when they're out in the city? Um, uh, community. Oh, community month. Right. So they'll, they'll text us, um, if they're gonna, if they want to come and script cases, but they've got the whole community to, to ask, which is, at least 30 docs. Um, and then they're also responsible for the, for the VA. Um, so I'm, they're usually with us at least once a week when we're operating out in the community, um, which is, has its pluses and minuses, obviously. Right. It's a great opportunity to, to train the next generation. I, I have a, you no, know, I wanted to comment, Joe and I were on your website today looking at some of the procedures and I think the difference maker was your stream of consciousness discussion of what's going through your mind as you're prepping the patient, as you're moving the toes through range of motion and things. I just thought that was very unique. And I think it's uh, student friendly, it's resident friendly, it's surgeon friendly. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I commend you for that. It's brilliant. And, um, it's humbling. Uh, yes, indeed. Right. Like. It's, it's humbling to not like, you know, it, there's no way to, co to convince people that there's no script, but you can kind of tell right from us chatting. Yeah. And uh, the only heads up sometimes we would get, we'd be driving here in the morning at 5 a.m. And, and hey, one would say, oh, by the way, uh, we have an Achilles that we're talking about in 10 minutes. Right. And so so we would show up and, and most of it is it, it's it's just a discussion. And some sometimes the things we say aren't 
completely correct. Um, and, and I think that's, that's part of the valid component of it where, you know, the other doc might correct the other one. Um, and to look back, even sometimes the technique, right, is really hard where you're like, man, I could have done that a little better. Or there was uh, that incision was a little long, a little medial, a little lateral. I futzed around with that screw a little bit. But that's that's the real component. Um, and that's that's what I don't I think we're too afraid to show that. And, and from my training, you know, to see Jack Schubert show um, studies that aren't perfect. Uh, it, it, that is, that, that is an extrapolation of that training is, is, is not everything that we do is perfect. It's, it's it, we, we strive for that, but it doesn't work out. Neither does chatting at five in the morning, you know, it's not perfect. Um, but I think people appreciate it. Well, there's no doubt. Let me ask one more question. What kind of camera did you use? What did you opt for at the end? Yeah, it's a Canon M, uh, M50. <laughs> And uh, I think, yeah, I think that's the name of it. <laughs> and and did, what did you have to do to get the audio perfect? Did you need a special microphone or anything? Or? Uh, these ones right here. Really? Same thing. Really? Yeah. Uh, this, I mean, this is a, um, uh, dynamic microphone, uh, hooked up to a zoom H six where it's, I can have multi-track recording and then I can edit them individually. Wow. Um, so we, I, so the camera, we, I used to put up a microphone on the camera and record intra-op sound, but I found that <laughs> difficult to tune out all your music and be, you know, copyright, you know, kosher. So I ended up just cutting out all the audio and they say a lot of stuff in the OR I don't want out there. <laughs> the work of course. Well, that was the initial idea, right? That was like the initial idea was candid, interoperative discussion, and that it, it, it that just didn't work. It's hard. Yeah, like it didn't you're work. slowing down the case, you know. So it was way easier to get good footage, and I can slow it down, put it on repeat, and then we could talk about it over and over again, and then I can edit to the audio. And what Perfect. I what I like about that, so like thinking about there was one video, it was a tailor neck fracture. And I liked how the voiceover, you talked about certain things like, yeah, see that? That's not quite good enough. I hope we fixed it. And sure enough, the next thing is you're fixing it. And so that to, to Matt's point of the authenticity, right? The, the realness that things aren't perfect, but we make them as perfect as we possibly can. And if you can't, you keep getting it until it's good enough that it's, it's as good as it's going to get, especially when it's something like trauma. When it's reconstructive, maybe we, we look at different parameters, but I appreciated so much the, again, how much time you spend, A, just recording the video, then B, going back through it to talk through the thought process, to talk through the decision-making and the, um, what we're seeing on the intraoperative fluoroscopy, what you're seeing intraoperative into the, the talus through the surgical incision. And then you have diagrams. Like there's just parts that, again, for a student to have that experience and they can slow it down, they can rewind it, they can be like, wait, I didn't quite understand that. That's invaluable. That's invaluable. So I really appreciated the, the, the voiceover that you do that walks through some of the focused decision making. I don't, I don't like Jeff and Joe, I, like you guys know, I, I really don't think people appreciate that part. Yeah. Um, I don't think they put themselves in that situation, you know, because um, it, in a perfect world, I would want to drive into the clinic 530 in the morning and Chu says, hey, here's your video. Take a look at it really quick. Let's look at the Taylor neck fracture. Right. And so to that point, like it is like, oh, man, that is that's not a good spot. Oh, thank goodness we repeated that. Right. So like like some of that stuff, it's so real and it's it's hard to see initially. And then there's sometimes where like, oh, that that's what we settled for. Right. And, uh, you know, settling is just an, an awful word. Uh, but sometimes, you know, that, as you know, the enemy of, of better. Right. Yeah. And so like it, 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 it can get to a point where, you know, there's certain variables and, you know, you've got a product bone. It's like, okay, th th this is not going to make a functional difference. I'm just trying to make an x-ray pretty. Yeah. This will functionally, this will be fine. Um, but that, that also authenticity, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, the beauty of it is we had three different 
four, technically four different brains. And Chu had a different idea on that, which none of us liked, but we went with it. Um, and it, it made the authenticity better. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think it's better to listen to actually, nobody wants to listen to something scripted. Right. It really, pro- it's a very professional product that again, to your point, you know, younger learners may not fully appreciate until they try to watch, you know, some 20 minute YouTube video that just goes on random tangents. So, um, it's a very professional product, which is not available. Semantically, professionally, it is not professional, <laughs> right? Like it's not as professional as what it should be right. in the, in the, in the classic word of that. It's not, that's well, the hard part. I haven't heard any, any major, uh, language issues. So <laughs> Having operated with you. Every word, I cut everything out. <laughs> <laughs> All the ums. <laughs> oh, Lordy. So I have a question for you. You know, you put yourselves out there. I commend you for it. Was there any self consciousness going on during this? Were you thinking, oh man, I'm putting myself out there? Or uh, I don't know if I should do this. Did, did you have any of those thoughts going through your mind? I've, I've changed how I do Achilles approaches. I've been. Uh, um, what's the good word for it? Um, electronically shamed, I guess. Um, so maybe I have a little archaic, uh, big incision for an Achilles. So I, I've changed that up. So th- for that part, it's been good. Like the challenge for me has been, um, has been, has been really nice. Um, cause most of the stuff, you know, we're, you know, you, you have to be confident with what you do and, um, but that continues to evolve. It continues to change. And, you know, as, as soon as you, think you know everything about it, it's probably time to quit, right? And so once you realize that, man, I, I really don't understand much of what I'm doing, um, I think that's a good place to be. Um, and then the videos. So we did a, we've, we've done a couple videos from overseas where uh, docs have, have asked, hey, how do you do um, an approach for a posterior lateral tailor process excision? Or how, how do you do this? And so um, specific questions, we would actually give a video response that, that was fun for me to do. And to hear the comments back, like, man, the surgery was so much easier or, you know, we hadn't thought about that approach. Like the, those things, um, help me, they challenge me. Um, but yeah, the, the whole process has been humbling actually. That's we should sad. come and video you, Jeff, and we'll just have you, we'll have you voice over your stuff. You know, um, I have to admit when we, when I started this podcast, I was a nervous wreck on the first couple. <laughs> so it's because I, you know, we all give lectures and we're all talking, we're all out in public, but with the second you start putting things, uh, as, as Joe and I call evergreen, right. It's there forever, right. For everybody to see, um, it, you know, it makes you think twice, but you get comfortable with it over time. And I'm, I mean, we had that a learning process too, but, um, we weren't doing it while we were, you know, incorporating surgeries and thought processes. And so I, I just commend you. I'm, I'm off. I'm totally impressed. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, so Joe, I have a question, you know, so Joe and I, we, our offices are what, I don't know, 20 yards apart. And I could hear, you know, this is the first time I've ever heard your voice on normal speed. Just so you know, <laughs> that. usually it's on like double speed or something. I put you on 1.75. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> and uh normally i talk a lot faster anyway <laughs> yeah but uh so have, have you brought this package of of film and 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 this incredible opportunity for for uh, surgeons residents students have you brought it out to schools because i saw you had like you've got subscriptions and things but like can we bring this into our school i mean for a fee to make available to all of our students yeah yeah, absolutely. Kent State already subscribed all their fourth years to it. Did they? All right. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely something we can make happen. All right. That makes sense. How about residency programs? Have you really tapped into those? Or? Yeah, there's a few programs that use us on a yearly basis, and we just renew their, uh, you know, the graduating third years will expire their accounts, and then when the first years come in, uh, we'll be generating accounts for them. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. I was thinking, Joe, that this would be great for our students as they go through their their pod surge one, pod surge two, pod surge three, because we emphasize different things throughout the uh, that period of time. So I'd love to talk to you more about this for our students. So I uh, appreciate you making it available. Yeah. yeah, I wish I would have had it. I think it's easier for me to see um, the visual component after learning the verbal component. 
Um, and that, and that not, might not be the same for everybody. Right. Um, but for me, that, that was an easier process. And, and, it, but it, when you think of training, that has to be the case, right? Um, cause that's how, that's how we progress, you know, with after second and third year is that you have to visually see it, visually do it. Um, but sometimes the little intricacies, um, are a little easier to see, um, if you see somebody else do it. Um, and maybe you're better prepared, you know, the first time you go through it. Um, I that's I not see one, do one, teach one. It's yeah. see one, see one, see one, see one, do one, teach one. It almost is. I, I would agree with that, actually. And and I yeah. think that that's a really important point, I think, to to sit on for just a second, especially. So I, you guys know I've been teaching now for, you know, over 10 years, primarily in the surgical realm. And what I have found interesting shifting over time, students want visual resources. They don't want to have to go to a textbook. They don't. It's it. There is something that's just not clicking. It's not registering. And in fairness, I don't think it registered even when I was a student. Again, I wish I had all these video resources. But the fact that this is something that the the demographic needs and wants, and there isn't really good materials to direct them to, which is when I found out about you guys, it was Christy King who had, had mentioned it. And she's like, have you, you know, have you used this for the students? And I was like, I haven't even heard of it. So of course I looked it up. I reached out to you guys. And it was, and a lot has changed even from two Oh, wow. Almost three years ago now, um, in terms of what materials you've put out there. So, um, I think it's certainly an area that I expect to start to continue to explode. Um, but again, the thing that I think is valuable is the attention to detail in building a full case workup, but it's not an hour or two hours long. It's something that's easily digestible. And so the reason I put you on 1.75 I have no idea how students put me on two times speed. I think you would have a small stroke, but they do it. And so can you like coherently hear what you guys are talking about at 1.75 speed? And you can, because again, if they look at this and like, okay, this is a 27 minute video. Well, I've got 15 minutes before my next whatever. All right. If I put it on two times speed, I can get through this. And they are very optimized in how they manage their time. So again, finding content that is well scripted, well demonstrated, but also can fit into various time parameters is fantastic. So my next question to you um, would be, rather than just talking about how much I love your product, is how often are you guys, create? because obviously this takes a ton of time, so how often are you guys kind of creating new content? Um, what's maybe if you guys have some things you want to talk about, new things that might be coming down the pike, what does the process look like for you guys? The process from start to finish, um, you know, we uh, we go in and film the surgery. I pre-edit the video so that there is a kind of um, truncated video that is raw, muted, and highlights the major points of it, including the pre-op and post-op imaging and any pertinent uh, clinical photos. Um, I tell these guys this is the video we're doing and. Kabi did it or Haas did it or whoever did it. Um, I don't show them the video. They just show up and we just go. <laughs> so that's why you get a lot of authentic like, oh, I don't know about that x-ray, but no worries. I got your back. <laughs> I'll, you know, I, I'll make sure you, you got the good x-ray in there too. But I think having the redirections of those x-rays of those guide wires is important to show because that's real life. Yeah. Um, so once we have the voiceover recorded, um, I edit through all of the audio, cut out all the ums and any any chunks that's not pertinent. I'll cut it out, and and then I'll match the video to the audio. If there's a part where we go over it multiple times, um, I've learned enough editing, like it, to to be able to you know do the the uh, you know, I edit everything on Final Cut Pro X on the Mac. And it has all the tools I need to do everything I need to do. And we're not doing fancy like color corrections or um, crazy cropping or, you know, uh, masking or anything too crazy. Some of the um, animations I do take some time to do to demonstrate when it's extra pertinent, but it's not, it's not too complicated. And I, I feel like it's way it's, it's the, the reason why we're so different is um, you can either train a, videographer and editor podiatric surgery or you could train a or teach myself a podiatrist how to do all those other things yeah. and the 
you know, the explosion of content since the COVID pandemic has, I mean, you can f- figure out everything out when it comes to video editing. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it took quite a bit of time initially where if I was to put like a 30 minute video, it would probably take like 30, 40 hours of yeah. actual yeah. filming, editing, audio, all that, all that stuff to be able to put something together. Now, um, a 30, like a one hour video will probably take me five to 10 hours total to do, um, but still a significant, um, time investment. Um, but yeah. it's been fun. It's been fun. And yeah. Yeah. If you, if, uh, you know, the interesting part is we're always open to ideas. I, I would want, I mean, not, which we still haven't been able to tap into. I would love to do grand rounds from different residency programs where the two programs are connected via Zoom um, because you've got completely different mentalities, you know, uh, in in Virginia versus Florida, right, versus Arizona, the West Coast. And, and to have two groups there going through raw, right, going through a grand rounds, the hard part is the residents are really uncomfortable, and we, we've kind of toyed around with that idea here. And, and we haven't we haven't published a couple of those just because, you know, when they're put on the spot, they feel uncomfortable. They don't want to be out, which I get. I mean, I, mean, I totally get. Um, but I, I would like the idea to do attendings. I don't mind roasting another attending. I don't mind being roasted either. Right. So like if we have, you know, two different groups, we've got two different programs and you put us up and you put cases, and the attendings go through it. I think that would be awesome because um, I would want to see that, right? I, I would want I would want to see Joe uh, stumble a little bit and stutter, <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure people want to see me stutter and and you know uh, do something different than someone else would do. Um, so that that's something that I I really think would be invaluable um, because it also goes down to how how do you work through a case you can show the you know, the fourth years, once they get to try to get a program, how do you, how do you work through it? Because not every answer is perfect. There's multiple different ways to go through that area. And they could see like, I, I wouldn't have approached it this way. Oh, Joe is, a, it, it came around a little different perspective. That's how, I, that's how I would handle it. Um, I think that would be fun, you know, and if we could set up, you know, uh, a grand rounds with you guys and us, uh, I think that would be a lot of fun to do. I might be able to recruit well, some people to uh, to join yeah, that because be I think there might be a lot of people that would find value and, and enjoyment out of it, even though, yeah, it's very vulnerable and a little stressful. It is. That's the hard part. <laughs> it's, it's just finding someone that's willing to do that. Yeah. But but teaching doesn't happen without that. That's right. the problem, right? right? Everybody wants to learn something. Everybody wants to watch somebody else, you know, be in that position, but they don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, and that, and that, and that, and that's where the scrutiny comes. That's what, that's where the humbleization comes. You know, that's when you get called out like uh, that, that's, that's part of medicine. That's what, that's what we call M and M, right? M and M was developed for a place for docs to bring cases that they screwed up, right? That they, that the, the the M and M was there. There's, this is a safe haven to show a case, to learn for other docs, residents, interns, faculty, even, even students to see like, this is how I don't want to screw this up in the future. Right. And so we, we can't get back to that. We have a hard time getting to that place because, because now it's exposed, right? It wasn't exposed in the house of San Francisco general hospital where we would be in a room with 40 people and you started sweating and you got embarrassed and you said wrong stuff and it never left the room. Now it can potentially leave the room. That's the hard part. And that's what, that's what nobody wants to see, but they want to see. Right. And so if there's a way to slowly incorporate that, like grand rounds, not necessarily an M and M. I think that's a way to get teaching to the masses to show vulnerability and, and true medicine, right? It's true. It's, it's true medicine. I know that we can be the conduit for that, Matt. I mean, we've got, we're CME approved at the college and uh, we can help coordinate. And I think you're right. I think that it brings a humble nature to the experience. It brings everybody's, and I don't want to say true colors, but a knowledge base to the yeah. forefront and a, and a wealth of experience by so many doctors that, like you said, you know, sometimes you don't always have the perfect result. The enemy of good is better. When is that? Right. Yeah. Things like right. that. Yeah. Really important. Yeah. That's, that's a good, a when idea. is that? That's yeah. a, that's a great statement. When is that? Yeah. And it, it's interesting. Cause when we think too, like the, the, the residents as they're learning, 
they're trying to take everything in, but they don't always know even what questions to ask, right? Like I remember there was nothing more humbling than coming out of residency and being an attending where you're now having to explain what you're doing and why. And that moment where you're like, well, that's, that's just the way I, I watched everyone do this, but I never asked why, or in my case, I did ask why, and I got all these different answers. So why am I choosing to do it this way and having to kind of wrap a framework around that? But that decision-making is what they need to learn. They can learn the steps from YouTube. They can learn the steps from a textbook. Like that, that part of surgery, the s- technical steps is not what's, what's hard about doing surgery. It's the decision-making. When is it better to overcorrect something or undercorrect something? What is the thought process when, okay, that's not quite good enough. We need to make it better versus that's good enough. Leave it alone. Don't make it worse. So even just learning how to capture that amongst us as we teach each other, I think is so valuable because there's a lot of times that I still question that, like, oh, this is, nope. I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is the right decision, but it's what I'm going to go with because it's what I feel the most comfortable with. So I, I love that idea. And I think. Yeah, this, that's how crazy this is, right? Is that, uh, oh man, was, was I a third year when you were a student? Yes. Or was I, you, was you I a first year, year attending? Nope. Oh yeah. You would just, you had just become an attendant because you only stayed with us for one year when I was. A yeah. So, so for me to agree with a student's perspective yeah. way back when, right. I mean, that's pretty cool to say, right. <laughs> um, which, which, which I completely agree with you. And that's, that's, that's the humbling part is that I, I think the why I, I, I think to start to, to reiterate that. I think you can make a terrible surgeon into a good surgeon with good decision-making process. Um, And so, and, and the, the plus and the, the, the best component is somebody that has good, good experience and they can operate well and they've got a good brain, but not everybody does. And so I, I, the interesting part is you can actually make somebody that isn't very technically astute, very good Mm -hmm. with the right process and the right surgery, because it's, it's not hard to necessarily carry out what you need to do. It's really getting to the end point of what needs to be done. Um, and, and that's really where the, the FASA, the foot and ankle surgery Academy, that's where it truly started. It was like, all right, here, here is what we have. What do we need to do with it? What could we make worse? How could we make this worse? And what are the other options? Like, are there other options we could have done that could have got to the same endpoint if you're better at it, right? There's things that are more technically demanding. And if you can do something simpler that gets to the same endpoint, who cares, yeah. right? The patient needs a good outcome and you need to know why to get there. It's not a monkey driven procedure, right? And that's, that's what Haywan and I struggle with as we, I, I feel like a lot of the training that's starting to come out is robotic, it is, this is what you have on the x-ray. This is what we do because the book shows it and that's it. And that, that, what if something falls apart in the OR? Yeah. Like I think the best surgeons can get themselves out of a hole. I don't think it has to do with start to finish. It really comes down to more their tertiary issue. <laughs> what happens when round two fails, yeah. right? How do you get to the third component to get a patient well, yeah. right? Um, and so, yeah, for... Anyway, I, I agree with you. It's um, humbling to say, which is pretty cool, actually, for yeah. me. Then uh, Stanford University had done a study looking at um, hand motions of surgeons. It was general surgery, and they were looking at uh, bowel loop closures for, you know, like an x lab. And it was interesting because there were, when, the, when we look at things like, you know, can AI, can robots do surgery, right? Can we train a robot to do surgery? And the answer is yes. What we can't yet train a robot to do is make really good decisions. And the reason we can't train the robot to do that is because we don't know how to teach each other how to make good decisions. And so this is so interesting. So they looked at this with this bowel loop, and I'm hoping I can get the details of the study correct. But basically, they had two different tiers that went down. Surgeons that made high-risk decisions but still closed the bowel without a leak. And surgeons that did everything technically perfect and had no bowel leak. And then obviously there were people that made bad decisions and got a bowel leak, and then people that made good decisions but still got a bowel leak, right? So looking at, okay, well, how is it that people made a high-risk decision but still ended up with a good outcome? And it was their decision-making, like the way that they throw their stitches, the, the suture that they chose, like little things that we wouldn't necessarily think to communicate to each other necessarily. It's just 
the way that the internal processings of their brain was working, they still got the desired outcome, even though, you know, technically speaking, based on the risk stratification, they made the quote unquote wrong decision. So I thought that that was really interesting in this idea of as we train each other how to do surgery, how do we go through the thought process and the decision making on essentially every single thing that we're doing? Because that's really what is valuable in humans doing surgery. And I think there is a place that there will be things that could be done by computers in the future and robots and such. But there are some things that will never be able to be done without a human at some right. degree of control. Have, so have you had have you had Shannon Rush on your show no, yet? No, no, I, I so, sent him an email. So like I, I have to credit him for exactly what you're saying. And I think about it every time, especially when when residents talk about it. My third year, I, we were at Kaiser. I was at Walnut Creek is where two of my kids were born. Right. And uh, it's busy, like yeah. super busy, a lot of trauma. And he's just standing in the back. Right. Like this. And uh, his his he would always say, which is hard for me to admit, you know, now this is going to be published. But like he's like, uh, someday, Cobb, will make a surgeon out of you. Right. And so, <laughs> like, I always remember that in the back of my head. But I at one point. So we were just doing a simple subtalar fusion. Right. And everything was going fine. But like he hadn't come in yet. And I said, when do you come in and help me? Like, <laughs> when is your, dis- like, this is coming as I'm about to graduate. I'm trying to figure this out. Like, when do you step in? Like, what is the point of no return? Right. And so, you know, not to, not to use his language on here, which I can't right, or some of my language in the OR sadly, but he said, he says, Cobb, I step in right before the point that you F it up before I can't fix it. And so that, that is what the robotic and AI stuff can't determine. There is a point where you can still fix it, but the repercussions of that fix are astronomical, yeah. right? And that, that was his end point. Like, I will let you go until there's a point where I'm going to have to do a lot more work to get it done. And I can see what that is. You can't see that yet yeah. with the robotic or the AI part. And that, that, that's what we're trying to convey here. Yeah. I don't want to get to that point in the videos and you know, maybe there'll come a point where we do a separate, ugh, a, a, a separate uh, group of surgeries with an intraoperative mess, um, which it, like to stomach that and even internally process that right now sounds awful. We'll do awful. it on simulation. We'll do it on cadavers. Ugh. We could figure I mean, out we, how to do you it. You know, the, the, fortunately, I don't have many of those, but we do have some of those where it's like, all right, we uh, take it down. I got to take this down. It's yeah. not good enough. Let's yeah. start over. Um, and that would be a really cool side, um, subsidiary, small group, like, all right, where, and, and to look at it, right? Like, what did we do wrong to get to that point? Could we have stopped three minutes before yeah. and said, Hey, like that interfrag screw is good enough. Like it's not going to f- affect functionality to stop Swiss cheesing it. Yeah. Right. And then go back. Right. Like where, where does that happen? And I think that's to your point. That's, that's where the robotic stuff can't help us yet. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so funny. Jack Schubert just commented on the exact same idea. This, oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, and actually I'm going to do the spoiler alert. He specifically did not say Shannon Rush's name because he said he already had enough of an ego, but he talked about the, the Rush effect, right? The Shannon effect that we would always say, like, he just made things look so easy, right? And this exact idea that with a lot of practice and focused practice, right? Not just doing things for the sake of doing it, but being very in it and focused on what you're doing, you can make things look very easy to the point that then it becomes easy because you've developed that skill set. Um, and I, I hope that he will, I know how busy he is, but I do hope that at some point he will agree to come on the show and just talk about, cause he's also, my experience with Shannon, he's always been incredibly humble, but, um, I thought it was funny that Schubert talked about the Shannon rush effect, um, to, to exactly to your point. So there yeah, you go. That's, that's for the audience when they're like, who is he talking about? Yeah, I love I mean, a, a, a lot of a lot of the times in the OR, we we uh, Zach and I even choose like don't don't zone out, yeah. like you can see it. Like after about forty five minutes, an hour, you can see the residents start to zone out. Like don't zone out on me. Yeah. This is we're not done yet. I I have to be here. You have to be here. And, and trying to get them to get into that mindset, um, you know, like you have to stay here the whole time. You can't you can't zone out. Yeah. Closing. For me, that's an organ. You're closing an organ and you get lazy on your closer. 
closure, you get, you get infections, you get open wounds, that you've completely compromised that entire hour and a half that you've put in. Don't zone out, right? Um, and that's the hard part is to stay there. And then you've got five of those in one day, right? Like you have to be present. Yeah. You have to be present every single minute. That's the hard part to teach. You can't teach a, a robot to do that yet. Um, yeah. Uh, that, how, how do we do that? That, that? that would be a cool process, like to have another subset of FASA, you know, the, the mental integration. How, how do you stay there? How do you stay focused? How do you not zone out? How, how, do you, how do you not start thinking about dinner? How do you not start thinking about the family? You know, how do you continue to be present in the case? Um, I, I don't have the psychology to teach that component, but that would be fun to do, actually. Wow. <clears throat> We're touching an idea. idea. We should do that. An emotional, I mean, that'd be cool to do. Possible. You don't think it's possible? <laughs> I mean, what you're talking about is like intense focus on details of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And sometimes um, when the residents just don't have that experience or ability to think that way, it just doesn't happen. So they zone out. You, you know, there's, there's a bunch of really cool stuff with neuroplasticity and mm -hmm. Focus like the the Mendy bands that can read the amount of blood flow to the frontal lobe, which is essential for executive function. Some people have it for forty five seconds. Other people can have it extended periods of time. So I love that discussion because uh, what also dawned on me, Joe, that this needs to be mandatory listening for our students when this when this one gets posted. So and you know this it's like uh, I, we always get like to such great conversation like right at the end. So just to throw one more study out there that, that was looking at all of this stuff. So they did that where they had like the EEG monitoring and so surgeons on surgeons? Yeah, that were in their expert. Oh, I think it was cardiothoracic cool. surgeons. Okay. And cool. so and they were they were looking and what was interesting again is actually through the majority of the, and I, I hope I get all this right, the majority of the surgery, they were in that flow state where they were just, it, not mindless, but they were, they had been so practiced at something that it was um, automatic. But in the peak parts, whatever the peak part was for that period, their brain waves were like massively engaged. So whatever it was, right, if they're like putting in a heart valve, like the an individual peak points, you could like look at it and the surgeon would go back and look like, yeah, that's, that's awesome. when we were sewing the, you know, aorta or whatever. And so again, it's so interesting, this idea that, and James Clear talks about this, the atomic habits guy, like this idea that you can get so good in your daily practice of something, but where we start to trip up is when we just get too complacent, right? It's okay to have things become automatic, but there are key parts where we have to be zoned in. And what's hard as a resident is you have to be zoned in kind of all the time because you haven't gotten that automatic automaticity of your practice yet. So I just and, so many fun and, things to talk about. Yeah, that's and that's what I want the residents to really know. Like I, I want them to know that I'm I'm watching for that. Yeah. I'm waiting for that. And when that when that clicks, I'm ready to really start teaching. Yeah. If if you don't want to do that, I'm not interested. I like, I, I can't teach that component. Um, and so that, that, and I say it all the time, it just never clicks. It does for some. Yeah. And the ones that it does, man, I, I let them fly. Um, and so you can see it happen. You can see the switch turn. You know, if there's, if there's a case where to the very end, they are a little ahead of me in prep and they're ready. Yeah. But if, if you can't do that on your own, I can't teach that. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to stress that enough. It's, it, you know, I don't, man, I, I don't know how to get that point across. Uh, and I wish there was a way to do that. I wish there was a way for them to feel like it's real. You know, I, they are there. Um, and it's a privilege. It's actually a privilege for them to be there. And I remember, you know, I always, always stood at the head of that table until that doc said, Hey, Cobb, you know, once you, once you come to the foot and, and then I was ready to go, but I never assumed that I was there. Yeah. Um, and I, and once even being there, that, that was the true privilege of like, all right, I, I'm ready to help take care. I'm not taking care. I'm helping. Yeah. Right. But I, I wish I could teach that component. How do you get that switch? How do you get, how do you get them to, to realize that we're ready. We, I mean, we want to do that, right? As, as people that are training, docs that are training, we want to give that process over because I'm not doing this. 
till I'm 68 like Schubert. You know, I'm not. I, I want to be done before that, and I want to be able to to give some of that back somehow. And I, but I want them to want that. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know how to get them to want that yet. Um, and that would be a that would be a cool discussion too. Like, how do you get docs to want to do it? How do how do we do that? You know, that'd be fun to get the rushes and the Schubers and the and and the the the, the Mendocinos and the you know Cancerati's. Like, how do you get all these people together and have these opinions? Like, how do you get people? to want the desire to learn. Um, cause I haven't figured that out yet. Truly haven't. Uh, I'm not sure if it's nature versus nurture at that point, but, it, but there's the, the, the problem is you're still going to have a doc that gets out there to, to, to help people. Right. So, right. So you're stuck. You, you have to get at least the best, I hate to say product, but you do, you got to get the best product possible So is there a better way? Is there a better way to nurture? Is there a better way to encourage, right? Like when we go and teach and we throw a PowerPoint up there, half, half of the attendings or half of the students are like this, right? right? And so you stop and then all of a sudden the phones go down. Like it's, there's, it's a different environment. So we don't like that, but we have to change, which is why the, the, the videos have been a different implementation, right? People don't want to read. Yep. They want to watch a video. Yep. They don't want to read. And so, but in the, in the discourse of that, how do we then implement that as well? And then how do we also change the nurture? I'm not good at that. I know that because some of the old gestalt, I have a hard time changing, but you know, if we can show a different way that works, I'm all for it. But I think it needs more brains than just me and Chu and, and, and Haas and Richie and, and you in this, Jeff. Like, really, like, how do we do that? I think the Academy might be a launching pad for that. I think what you guys have done is set the stage for maybe that next level of. I want more brains in there. <laughs> I, and I, you know, it's yeah. it's not a it's not about a revenue process for us. You know, that's why, you know, no, no, no. I, I love Richie. I really, and, and for me to not be there when, when she was training, it, it still hurts my feelings. Right. But I, I don't, <laughs> right. I don't maybe think you it, wouldn't have liked me as much if you had to work with me for three that, years. That, that I got a big grumpy abso- in my second year. That, that may be absolutely true, but the word product has a, it's hard for me. We never started this as a product. We started this as a way to train during COVID when residents couldn't learn to teach, you know, and it, and it has, it's, it's turned into a, a product entity, but it hasn't changed our mindset. Like how do we get docs better? That's all right. Cause we've got a finite amount of time that we do this and we have to pass it on. That's how it works, which sucks, right? That part sucks, but that that's the nature of it. That's Absolutely. why I jumped from residents to students. I figured if I can get early, <laughs> I've got more time to help figure out how to engage that passion. So. You mentioned that Joe, that's when, so, uh, yeah. Matt and, and I started the North Colorado surgical residency program with Dan Hatch back in. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Back in like 1999. Oh, Hatch and I just taught the club foot. That was fun. That's cool. That's cool. I was going to ask you about the Ponsetti because so we didn't get to that. Yeah. Always, that's cool. I wanted to see Ponsetti. Uh, but I, I just, I find it interesting uh, when we start, you know, educating that we're working with residents, we're working with clerks. And I did the same thing, Joe. I thought, oh my gosh, if I go be a dean and get these students earlier, we can instill some of that, some of that nurture that we're to, that needs to be instilled. And and but it's a process, I'll tell you, because we see them as students coming from a long ways away. You know, we interviewed uh Ben Collin yesterday. Oh yeah. He was looking at his CV and I could have told you when in 2007 at CCPM he was going to be a superstar, you know, so you can pick those students out and it's just fascinating. The whole educational process is, I think we're just touching on what the capabilities are for an educator to get the most out of their students and residents. I think the key is the third year or last year, whatever that is, third year of fellowship, right? When, when, they're, when we're truly afraid, like, oh my gosh, I have to go out without someone else's umbrella. And so I, th- I think that is the pivotal point um, when we change maybe how we do things or how we talk or how we teach or how we govern the discussion. You know, and, may- and maybe we're a little softer before then because um, I, I don't think... 
you know, it really hits our first year. I don't really think it hits the second, you know, but the last year, I think the realization when that starts to set in, I think that's when we really can change the mentality and to truly learn how to do that would be, that'd be cool to learn how to do that. Very cool. So let me ask you this question. If that third year could be that pivotal moment, more and more students are going to these tremendous fellowship opportunities where they're not only doing a lot of surgery, but they're managing the patients pre-op, post-op. Um, what do you think about the fellowship trend? Mm, I'm going to defer to Chu and then I'll give my opinion on that because I don't want to, I'll let you do <laughs> You want me? <laughs> my, my brain is still stuck on the previous topic. So, um, <laughs> Because I think the future is instant replay film. You know, yeah. like the NFL, you watch film yeah. all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, surgeons can't do that. But I think bariatric surgery is probably leading the way because everything's laparoscopic. It's already recorded. They have studies looking at like master bariatric surgeons get better outcomes than those that were rated as a little bit poor um, in their surgical technique. I think that was NEAJM actually. Um, so, you know, there's, there's like a whole surgical coaching, like organization now where you're looking at videos of your own procedures and have a colleague talk about your own film and talk about things you can do to be more efficient. Um, and we're just scratching the surface on that. Like, it's so hard to do self-study film for podiatry and orthopedics. But I mean, I think that's where the future is at for improving ourselves. Yeah, I wonder if we can't follow the realm of sports and look at the eyes because the eyes lead, you know, confident eyes deliver good results in sports. Probably true in surgery, too. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, but back to the fellowship thought. Yeah, I'll give me 10 seconds. I don't have a problem with every single surgery that I do being being filmed. And I think it should be the case. I think there should be a camera in our lights in the OR and you film it. And if, if there is any, then, you know, uh, arbitrary issue or, you know, an incendiary issue that pops up, you know, whether that's litigatory or not, you've got, you've got an intraoperative camera that has visualized that. Um, I don't think that should be a bad thing. I think the insecure surgeons would be very, very opposed to it. Um, but that being said, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what I think about the fellowship. I, th I think it's a great idea for somebody that might have gone to an inferior program and they don't feel they have enough um, experience in one realm or the other. And, and for that, I think it's a great idea, a great idea. And, and can I say industry stuff on here and not get in trouble? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, so our, it's, our it's the same idea. It's the same idea with the lapoplasty, right? If you don't have enough experience with the lapidus and you feel like you need something to help you to rotate the first ray instead of a simple thumb, then fine. Like if that gets a better outcome, um, I think that's a great tool for, for somebody that uh, maybe has not done as, as many. And I think that's the same idea with um, – the fellowships, I don't think they're a bad thing at all. I think they can help. And, and some people, some residents are really insecure and afraid to come out or they haven't found a good job, right? Because that's hard. I remember like finding a good job is not easy. It's easy to find a job, but a good one's not easy. And so sometimes that can delay that process and it looks better on a resume. I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I know I didn't look for it at all. I was not interested. I felt um, I was pretty beat up <laughs> after, after I was done. Um, I couldn't imagine another year. Um, but I, I think it's a good, I think it's a good avenue, um, for some of the new residents coming out. I think there are, um, fewer really good fellowships than, than there are, um, that, that are worthwhile. I, you know, it seems like it's just exploded. The yeah. past five years, um, yeah. when I graduated residency seven years ago, there were very few options. I was looking for a limb salvage fellowship, but ultimately I ended up in um, joining the university, doing the limb salvage program there. But um, I think there's a lot more opportunity now, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, it's just it has to be right for you. Now, are you both in private practice together right now? Is that how it is? So yeah, there you go. The best way to predict the future is to create it. You guys are doing it. I love it. It's scary. It is. Oh, I remember. Yeah. It's the last thing I wanted to do. I did not. Really? 
No, I didn't. I didn't want to be in private practice. How'd you land in Albuquerque? Uh, <laughs> Zach, Zach was my co-resident. <laughs> okay. Right? Gotcha. And so I, I did two years at Walnut Creek, Kaiser Walnut Creek. And then he called and um, said, would you like to come out to the desert? And I said, absolutely not. Um, it, you know, and the, it, it's weird, like being in a big systematic, you know, CEO or not CEO, HMO type umbrella like Kaiser. Um, I never wanted to go to a, a place where I felt there was always that risk of, am I just doing this for the financial component, right? Because if you're honest with yourself, like that's always in the back of your mind. Like, you know, it does the patient really need this? And if you're under a Kaiser umbrella, you're getting paid the same if you give 45 people a Band-Aid or if you operate on 45 of them. And I, I never wanted that uh, financial pressure, I guess. Um, I guess I was always scared of it. Um, and so trying to come in with a platonic you know, viewpoint and idea and process. Like, I think that takes a lot more, uh, maturity, um, and, and strategy, even, uh, humbleization, right. As far as, as how you do that. Um, and I mean, obviously that, it, that sounds awful, right. For me to, to say, but it's real, right. That, that, that's the real part when people say private practice, like private usually, you know, just means we're, we're really, chastising patients and that that's not what we do here um at all and and sometimes we go to the other side where maybe i'm over kaisering people here in new mexico because uh, i don't think they would benefit from a surgery but that's yeah that's the main reason i didn't want to do private gotcha um and um, we, could go, we could talk forever um I have, I have one more joe can i ask one more question yeah, yeah. Uh, do you guys do any clinical trials in private practice because I, I, um, I guess I do. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm mostly diabetic limb salvage and, uh, there is a company that reached out to me to use our clinic as a site for one of their clinical trials. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to say definitely opportunity to do it in private practice. Um, you just have to put yourself out there and the opportunities can come. But if you use a particular product a lot, um, and the company has a good relationship with you, um, you know, I, I don't think you can't do this in Kaiser, right? Like, it's harder. Uh, but yeah, in private practice, you, you can be a consultant for a company. You could, but it's still an um, evidence-based approach. Like, mm -hmm. like you, like you're trying yeah. to do an evidence-based group on, can we heal this wound faster versus the placebo? Yeah. Right? And it's, so it's pretty segregated. There's yeah. really so, as yeah, little is, bias as possible. Right. 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 It is a randomized control trial yeah. It's not blinded because we know what product we're doing, but it is a randomized legit trial that, um, I guess I need to clarify is that whenever private practice sites are doing these things, I'm not coming up with a protocol or any of that stuff. I'm just told what to do and I'm paid. That's it. Oh, yeah. um, so that, that's the, to be honest, that's kind of why I don't like doing it. Cause I, <laughs> I don't like just being told this is how I have to do it. And I have to report the protocol and do all these things. And um, I would rather be the one gen creating the trial and, you know, coming up with the budget for all that stuff. Um, but anyways, that's beside the point. It's hard to do that in private practice. If you want to create your own trial, it's a lot easier in a university or like a major hospital. But in private practice, you're fronting all the money yourself. You're paying the IRB yourself just like two grand for a for an IRB <laughs> approval. I had to pay JFAS seven hundred bucks just to get my case series <laughs> in the manu in the manual. Let me, let me give you another perspective. I was in private practice for years. I did tons of clinical trials. I did the original dermograph. Uh, Apple okay. trials, all, all those. And yeah, it's a little more expensive and you're given a protocol and you have to follow it, right? They have central IRBs and things. But having been at two universities, and Joe can attest to this, trying to push things through the university environment while you're not at risk, it takes 10 times as long as it would when I was in private practice. And that includes NIH grants and things too. So I don't know. I just, I just asked because I think it's a great thing for private practice. Yeah. I mean, the, the other side is, I mean, obviously I've, 
I've got a regular shirt on. He's got scrubs. I mean, it, I, I got back from Norway last night at, at 1 a.m., right? And uh, and so, like, that, that that's the beauty of the private practice side is, you know, I, I can take that time off. Um, and so that, that's been, what's been most invaluable for me, not necessarily the, um, cause I don't practice any different. I still treat patients the same, you know, it's just the, the flexibility for me. That's awesome. All right. Well, I know we could keep talking, but we should pro this is one of our longer episodes now. Yeah. We pre- yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, it's been just such great discussion. Right. You got my brain thinking about some things we can do together. Joe, right. anything last from you? No, but we may need to have a separate talk about pediatrics, but we can, we can, yes. we can troubleshoot that. Maybe we can Let's do part two. Come. Yeah. We can always oh, do a part. That'd be, be awesome. Fun. Do a panel. All right. Okay. Let's we can do, do that. that. I bet, I bet Mitzi could get Dobbs to get on here. Could be a really fun kind of discussion. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys. We're humbled that you had us. Thank you so well, much thank- for taking the time. We're going to send each of you a Dean's Chat cup so that when you're getting up really early in the morning and filming some of your videos, you'll have some coffee with you with Dean's Chat on it, okay? All right. That sounds good. Thank you. That was great. Well, thanks again. And Joe, thanks for being the host down in the studio. Yeah, thanks for letting me be in this. I just realized I didn't have your Dean's mug to... I've got a fresca. I mean, (laughs) my Dean's Chat cup. Anyway, um, to all of our listeners out there, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please give us a five-star rating. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube... Uh, please become a subscriber. And until next episode. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.